Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the new monthly webinar series, AI Analytics and Automation with Nick White. Today, Nick will discuss intelligent automation with AI. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. But if you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides and a recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And now, let me introduce to you the speaker of this monthly series, Nick White. Nick is a seasoned professional with over two decades of expertise, is dedicated to driving impactful business outcomes through the strategic application of data analytics and AI. His extensive experience spans diverse industries, showcasing a passion for leveraging data's transformative potential to fuel innovation, optimize decision-making, and streamline operations. Nick is recognized for his adeptness in assisting organizations across various industry verticals, consistently achieving positive business results through data-driven strategies. And with that, let me give the floor to Nick to begin his presentation. Hello and welcome, my friend. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? Fantastic. And your slides look wonderful as always. All right. Let's get going. Um, thanks for the great introduction again. I just asked everybody where they're from. Um, Lawrence, we are very close uh, to each other, by the way. Um, it's great to see everybody join um, about something I'm very passionate about, intelligent automation with AI. You know, what automation isn't intelligent <laughs> and um, what isn't automation that we build. So there's some pretty cool stuff to talk about here and I'm going to dive right in. Um, I'm just going to bring us to the agenda, right? First, um, I wanna give a quick introduction and some foundational definitions that I am gonna use today. Detroit, yes, and I am Canadian and I am from Detroit. So we are all people, um, maybe Canadians and people from Detroit that live in near Madison are you know, bound to be in this room. So uh, great to see New York folks too. So. I wanna start with introduction and foundation, um, go into some key benefits and use cases, talk about some challenges and those strategies that we can use to overcome those, talk a little bit about you know, what's coming up and just quickly recap what we talked about. Um, if you haven't been with me before, let me just be the first to tell you that I love interactions. So I am, I do have this set up so I can read the chat. Um, I'm not going to be able to type as I present, but I hope you guys will have a conversation amongst yourselves and also, you know, throw in some comments to things I am saying. Uh, that That's totally fine. Um, and I definitely encourage it. What you will notice about me, if you haven't been here before, is I'm not going to sit here and stand and deliver slides. Um, this is, <laughs> we are a data management community. Um, and it's super important that uh, we're a little informal, we're a little fun, because some of the stuff we ask people to do isn't so fun and isn't shiny. Um, and personally, I've just found by leaning into my uh, unique personality, I'll say, um, I've been able to get some stuff done and I'm not going to stop now. I'm too old to stop now. The audience, as you know, if you fit into one of these categories, if you fit into multiple ones, I have made this for you. I am all three of these, um, quite frankly. And uh, I think it's important that, you know, as data professionals, um, whether we're doing AI or whether we're doing the management side of it, that we're always thinking about how do we explain what we do, what we're trying to do to people who aren't in that space. Um, whether it's a business user, user or even a leader of ours that might not be in the details um, that wants to go and help sell um, internally what's going on. So if you are one of these, or if you can semi-identify as one of these, or if you identify as multiple of these, great, you're in the right place. And if you don't, 
that's okay too. I hope it's going to be at least somewhat funny to see me talk about this. As a reminder, this is not my first one if you haven't been to these before. You know, we've actually done four already, and we have one more this year coming up, and that's going to be AI for Good. There are links in the PDF that you will be able to access where you can go right to the recordings of these past ones. Um, and you can also get to the AI for Good one coming up next month where you'll be able to um, register for it there. Um, I want to ground everybody, you know, and I, I brought this out in our last um, in our last talk. And this is what I really think the big picture is, right? Whether whether we're doing a dashboard, whether we're trying to do data quality checks, whether we're trying to do intelligent automation, at the end of the day, we're trying to drive better outcomes by informing processes with better decisions. And those decisions are informed by data that comes through some sort of applied analytics stack, you know, and that could be a dashboard that could be just a, an AI forecast integrated into, you know, an important experience. Um, and then of course, all that doesn't happen without folks doing the work to take the data and find patterns. <laughs> and then more importantly, that can't happen until you are, you have the professionals that many of us are in here, or at least have started from, um, that are managing the data, that are collecting it, organizing it. So in my mind, at the end of the day, all of these things connect. And the way that I find to approach getting value, which is the most important thing, is to consider all of this. Now, we're not boiling the ocean, but you know we need to know what we're driving towards. We need to know how we're driving towards it. We need to know why we're driving towards it. Um, and I'm just going to bring up another thing. Whenever we talk about data, you know, and I believe this to be true, we are talking about data with a lowercase d, right? It's not an uppercase d, even though it's uppercase here. Ignore that. I'm just anal and I had to make sure that everything matches. But when I say lowercase d, these are not the truth. These are not exactly the facts. These are closer to facts, right? Data is created by people in process. So at the end of the day, we need to look at data as an input, not a silver bullet. And I say that about AI all the time. And I feel like I'm coming back to the fact that we have to say that about data as well, because data collection and creation, and even the analytics that go into it, they're all subject to bias, just like decisions and other things. So before I get into any of the specifics, I just want to ground us, or at least ground you guys, and share my bias, which is I believe this is my view of the world. And this is if we focus on those enablement outcomes, you know, as a collective community, I think we can help organizations really have tremendous impact with data, analytics, AI, and automation. And what this just means to me is that, you know, there's just this flywheel here where, you know, decisions are made, you know, those processes are executed. We see what happens when those processes are executed, and then we look to find patterns. And then hopefully, hopefully, those patterns are informing our next decisions. One of the biggest things that we can do, and I'm repeating some stuff that I've repeated before because I find it to be so fundamental and I really latched on to it, but we work so hard to get data and analytics into the hands of decision makers or into a system like an RPA system to automate things that if we aren't you know, aware that the people that we're trying to help, they're not impartial. So I'm just gonna talk about this bias, but one thing I wanna think about is the most important part of this flywheel is that decision maker. Can we make those decisions better? Can we ask the decision maker or makers? <laughs> and again, that becomes real complicated. 
but can we ask those folks, what would change your mind about what you're going to do anyway if you don't have data? That might be the number one question we can ask any stakeholders to make sure that we're giving them something that might actually impact a process and an outcome. You know, and then always, you got to have a flywheel when you do a presentation like this. And you also have to have a pyramid. So if we click down into just, you know, the one piece of it, right? <laughs> number four, but number one in our hearts, we've all seen a pyramid that kind of goes, yeah, you're, you're creating an experience on top. You're serving up the analytics. And for everybody here, AI is a version of analytics. <laughs> it gives examples instead of being rule-based. So as far as I'm concerned, it all goes together. It just depends how you're trying to solve the problem and find the patterns, right? So at the top, applied analytics and AI, that's really about how we're, you know, serving those up, you know, and how are we integrating them into processes, into systems, into experiences. Then you have that middle layer where you're either data mining, which I would define as, I have no idea what the question I want answered is, but can you find me some interesting things that might spark questions? Great. You're data mining. Terrific. Analytics. I know the questions. And either I have examples of things I can use for machine learning or AI, or I have a statistical rule-based, you know, approach I can take that I've used before that's mathematically and statistically sound that I can use to provide those answers. And then third, again, last but not least, all the work that we do to make sure that that foundation is in place. And I'm sharing this just so that we're all on the same page about what my perspective is. When I think and decompose that pyramid into a swim lane you know, diagram, and if you're playing presentation bingo, you might have a bingo already, but at the top is applied. And in general, we see these go into three different areas, decision support and optimization, you know, and that can mean a lot of things, right? That could be a dashboard, that could just be a number, that could be, hey, maybe something that goes into um, a system that nobody kind of sees in its form, but just informs like an ERP or something. You have intelligent automation, which we are going to dive deep in today. And then you have right, your recommendations and personalization, right? And then in the data mining and analytics swim lane, we have rule-based analytics. You know, this is typical, you know, before we had <laughs> the power of Python and R and Databricks and everything else, right? You know, people were in mini tab and doing all sorts of rule-based analytics, right? Um, still can be applicable in many ways. Um, it's just an extension of natural programming, which is, you know, rule-based or logic-based if-thens kind of thing, right? Then you have AI model creation. So when we think about AI model creation, it's not the same as like, tuning for a specific use case, right? Like anybody who works in AI, you know, <laughs> way deeper than I do on, in here can probably say, yeah, like if I go to this website, I can find all sorts of different models, you know, and the prol proliferation, ooh, um, I did pronounce that right, which I'm surprised, but the proliferation of foundational models because of open AI kind of open it up their kimono and showing us, you know, their models, that has really made the creation part probably less of the work than the model use case tuning. So a lot of these things, you know, and I see Mark has, you know, showed hugging face, what a great resource, you know, for, I don't even know, you know, I don't even want to call people who use AI models data scientists anymore because there really is like this missing role right now, which a lot of people are filling, which is an AI developer because the models are created. So how do we kind of integrate and orchestrate them and, you know, fine tune them or fine, fine tune the prompts even 
so that we get what we want out of them. You know, so that's that middle swim lane. And then everybody on here is well aware of the bottom, right? So I'm just trying to, you know, run the marble through and show you where I'm starting from and where we're going, you know, with that little, the little robot guy we're going to talk about deeper today. Um, let's talk about IPA, not, <laughs> not the beer, which man, they're good, but a lot of calories, um, intelligent process automation. Um, and what is it? You know, it, it's not just very hoppy, but it has, you know, all the process redesign and RPA, you know, which if you don't know, robotic process automation, it's when you take those two things, that process redesign, which is more functional with the RPA, which is more technology heavy, and you start to add in AI, right? So you're thinking of like, oh, what the heck's RPA? Software robots, okay? Can be regular robot, you know, like we're used to just envisioning, you know, robot robots, you know, like the Jetsons, but we're talking about software robots most of the time here. Um, and really it's just about if you've ever, you know, man, back when I was a data scientist in air quotes, which you can't see, but I just did, um, you know, just the fact of using macros <laughs> in Excel was a really good way to kind of have a computer do this RPA, right? So that, you know, um, folks wouldn't have to. So, you know, it really is about just doing it. But at the same time, you know, they're very accurate, but they need very, very clean, clean data. They need very, very simple, defined tasks to automate. When we add AIML to it, you know, now we're talking about intelligent process automation. You know, so I always say, there's rule-based and then there's ML. And ML is give me examples of what a cat is and then I will be able to go find cats. Whereas rule-based would be, you know, if then, if then, if then, and we're defining every little piece of it, right? So, you know, when you start to apply that to something as rigid and regimented as RPA, you're able to really accelerate you know, different things such as, you know, can you do some more complex processes? And we'll get into in a little bit more when I start to dive more into this as a thing. Now, if you have any questions up to this point, plug them in that chat. If you have any, you know, <laughs> stories about uh, RPA gone wrong, or maybe one time you did a crazy macro thing in Excel which man, I did it. It was so bad. I lost my IT resource and I had to make my own pricing tool. And I sat there and I taught myself Visual Basic and I figured out how to use macros and all that cool stuff just to do a very simple pricing tool because life happens and sometimes you have to be your own developer, which is fine. Uh, so let's talk about key benefits and use cases. All right. So how does AI fit into IPA? Again, this makes me want a beer. It's not even close to time beer 30, but you know, we're talking about, I can have a little more dynamic and flexible workflows. If I'm able to use examples, if I'm able to have the system learn from itself, if I'm able to like, you know, get a little more granular and handle exceptions and, you know, create kind of that, feedback loop, you're going to end up, again, if we think about the top of, you know, my eye chart <laughs> slide, I'll call it, how we can get to better outcomes is really from how do we, how do we inform the processes in a more dynamic way um, and a quicker way. So let's talk about the most obvious, unstructured data processing. A lot of processes you know, with your TPS reports and things of that nature, it has a lot to do with, you know, the things that were really hard to automate before were things where somebody had to read unstructured data. 
you know, again, traditional RPA was just really, really, you know, give me some tabular data and tell me, you know, if then, and then I'll do it. Um, now we're able to kind of create tabular data out of unstructured data. Um, so analyzing and extracting, if you just think about any process at any organization, a lot of emails, PDFs, images, maybe there's voicemails, right? So being able to process those within an RPA environment can make it even more efficient and even more powerful. Secondly, like, you know, traditional automation, it's up to people, <laughs> you know, it's up to people to learn or notice what's going on um, and then it kind of revise the predefined rules. Whereas AI driven systems, you know, we can tell it, right? We can tell AI systems, hey, within, within this context, you know, here's some things that might happen and you're, you're free based on the examples I'm giving you to, to understand what it is and make the choice. And then actually, if we feed you what happens as a result of your decisions, you can probably make it better, right? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about actual um, use cases here that are in play today, but really important. I mean, I've even heard, you know, and I think it was the CEO of NVIDIA, it's like from a user experience standpoint, you know, the design is gonna be like AI generated and it might even be AI generated to the pixel. And I always just think about how Netflix serves up, you know, their programming. Not only is it what they think you'll like, but it's also, hey, here's a picture that we think you'll like too. Like it really cool stuff happening, right? Um, and then finally, you know, the ability to make real time decisions. Um, you know, if you just think about anything, right? Think about a quarterback, since we're right in the heart of American football season. Um, and I live in Wisconsin, so I am, you know, and Detroit Lions are actually good now. So I kind of care. But just think about, you know, this is like a quarterback. You know, yeah, you got to play. But if you see something out there and you have to make an audible, as they call it, make an audible. And don't do the play that's not going to work, right? With AI, and really, you know, if we just think about AI as something that can, you know, do some level of human reasoning, but way faster than we can about, you know, things, they, it can't be like solving world peace or anything like that, but something simple as, hey, I can see these guys are coming in with a blitz, so I'm going to do a quick check down and I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Now you're able to do it. You know, you don't have to just run that play because that's the play the coach called and it's in the playbook. Yes, finally, finally Donald, I'm telling you, how many years? Um, we're finally not awful. So just think about it, like the idea that you have, you have this quarterback, you have this ability to read unstructured data, you have this ability to create a cycle and a closed loop of improvement and understanding, you know, without having humans all over all of it. And at the same time, that presents a whole ton of issues. Um, so we are going to definitely get into what those other issues are and how you kind of figure out how to get around those. So what are the benefits? Efficiency, yes. Like if we can automate more complex workflows, we can then, you know, and you you know these workflows, they are almost complex as a result of, you know, self-creation at organizations. Just imagine if you could get people away from that and more focused on things that are, you know, value added.
that aren't just, oh yeah, because this thing can't read it or make a split decision, you know, we need you to do it. Now, that's that's all good and fine, but at the same time, you know, as humans, I'll say, I think there's so much more value to, you know, just the inspiration and the things that, you know, automation can't do, AI can't do, right? Accuracy, you're gonna get better. You're gonna get better if you actually set up the system to learn and to be more consistent. Scalability, you know, just think of the idea of, you know, just like data processes have patterns, we can start to, you know, take, we've automated this one thing over here, we can apply it over here. So you just think about how it can scale, you know, doing exceptions, new inputs, you know, different areas of the business. It starts to allow for a much quicker innovation cycle. And then finally, like less errors, like honestly, I make, <laughs> and I have a six-year-old daughter, so I'm explaining all the time how many mistakes I make every day um, because she's still learning that that's just a part of life. Um, as of right now, because, <laughs> and I'm not saying Skynet is imminent, but as of right now, we have the ability to leverage AI and automation and systems of this nature to reduce the errors that we would have just because, you know, I'm tired <laughs> or, you know, I made a keystroke error. There's so many things that, you know, intelligent automation can, you know, definitely take care of. Um, I know when I was in positions within operations or, you know, more frontline positions of myself, I would try to figure out a system so that everything became way easier. Like that's how I got into, you know, AI and that's how I got into data and analytics and all of that stuff was just, I was always trying to find a way. I don't want to say to be lazy, but I want to say to not make mistakes by creating systems. So, you know, error reduction. Now we can look at all of this and we can say, great, people are losing their jobs. You know, I think, and I would tell, <laughs> and I do tell this, and I will tell, continue to tell this to folks that I consult around this type of um, technology on is you can be short-sighted and only look at, hey, I can eliminate headcount. Or you can be smart and keep organizational and creative skills and apply them to other more important things. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that's going to be what's needed. And short-sighted organizations will cut and then rehire. Um, we see it all the time in cycles. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. But at the end of the day, you're delivering extra capacity to your organization. How you invest that capacity is completely up to you. And I would recommend that you tackle more complex things and more creative things that, you know, technology just can't handle. So a couple of use cases of intelligent automation. Let's talk about finance. Um, I mean, fraud detection systems, you know, they're out there. Uh, I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but what I can say is that it's way, way harder to <laughs> commit fraud, you know, with some of the big banks. Now, I hate the big banks for certain reasons. Apologies for people who work for some of them. But at the end of the day, you know, AI is really great at protecting and preventing fraud. And, you know, JP Morgan is ginormous and that's a technical scientific term but they they've identified billions and billions of dollars you know they've saved on you know manual investigation times you know they've saved on you know the amount of times that they've had to you know even take calls and i mean this is one of the ones that is good for everybody um if you've ever known anyone 
who's been a victim of fraud, it's terrible and it takes you forever to kind of recover. So, hey, yeah, big bank doing big bank things, but definitely what a positive impact it has on everybody. And that is just, it's an intelligent automation, right? It's it's using all AI has to offer and and helping to prevent fraud. Now, when we get into something, <laughs> I mean, these are all, right? You can, these are all controversial industries, but they are the industries that we um, are given. Um, and this is one of the first use cases I did, you know, um, look like claims, um, policy documentation, <laughs> like who's reading all of this, right? Um, and one of the best ways and most prolific ways that AI is used in automation is really the OCR, you know, or optical character recognition. Um, and then you pair it with NLP and NLG or natural language generation, all these, all these NLs and all these acronyms, right? And you're able to really, you know, drive down healthcare costs um, and make sure that things are coded correctly. Um, huge, huge benefit there because man, just, <laughs> I don't know what the biggest healthcare policy document is. I don't know what the most, you know, um, what I would say is like, uh, difficult to read claim is, but man, that's hard. And 70% reduction in processing time is ginormous. Again, technical term. And then finally, last but not least, manufacturing. You know, the idea, and I always, I always point people to forecasting. Forecasting for, yes, natural language processing is cool. And so is OCR. But man, given the right inputs and guidance from um, humans that are very good at demand planning and inventory management, you can just, I mean, the amount of savings you can have, the amount of making sure, you know, the, the number of cases where people are not being able to buy what they need or get what they want. It's it's a game. AI should be. I always lead with that. If it, it's somebody that's selling things that have to be made, focusing in on forecasting and integrating it into your supply chain is so important because um, there's so many demand signals and there's so much inf information around this. And even if we go direct to consumer on a lot of things, or like Siemens, you might be you know more B two B certain times. Um, Man, huge impacts to do that. So those are a few cases where using AI in an RPA way is super duper impactful. I mean, 70% on that healthcare, that's crazy. Um, go ahead in the chat and let me, let me know if there is anything that you have run into that has just been an eye opener around automation, AI, whatever. Everything we build in computers is automated. So it's like, this is kind of interesting. But if you have something cool, um, definitely pop it in the chat. No need to worry about having to talk or anything. All right. So, wow, that stuff's cool. Um, but, you know, this is the worst thing ever too, right? Um, so let's talk about the challenges and risks that come in automation. You know, First, operations and people, right? Over reliance, <laughs> um, lack of flexibility, you know, error propagation. So, like, just all right, I'm running with this. You've heard about hallucinations, whoop, error propagation. Um, you know, again, the, these things are still, you know. <laughs> not humans that can't problem solve everything. They need to be told how to problem solve it. I'll say it again. This is another thing, but these are genius five-year-olds. There's nothing to it. So, you know, 
balancing and ensuring that, you know, there is the right level of human augmentation is very, very important. And it is a huge risk. Um, secondly, data and bias. So we're all here and we all know, hey, poor data quality and integrity, that's bad for business. It sure is. As I said before, using the lowercase data, you also bring in biases to, hey, who programmed this, who created the, the data, who selected the training data, who did the reinforcement, you know, um, testing, like all of these things we know very well are important. And man, it's like, my only hope <laughs> for this for this group is that again the amount of investment in ai today because of how cool you know all of these large models are doing i just hope that something happens where people actually learn that they need to invest in data management and they need to invest in these things that seem like a drag, a block, a slowdown, but they are so important. Like it is fundamental and it's so hard to sell internally because if nothing goes wrong or if it works, nothing happens. If it fails, something bad happens, but it's really hard to get people to realize that, you know, I'm not wishing bad on anybody or anything, but some big failures because of data quality and, and bias and all of that stuff could go a long way to paving the way for, you know, folks that are on this call to be able to do their jobs and really have it embraced. And then finally, you know, privacy and security are always going to come up. You know, we are talking about using all sorts of different data. Um, we're using interactions with the system. There, there are all sorts of things going on here. It's always going to be a risk. I mean, it, it's just hard to, it's hard to fathom how little control people and organizations have on some of their data, right? A lot. And just throwing things through another automated black box is definitely a way to lose control if you're not thinking of it before you even start. So how do we mitigate this? Um, human in the loop, human in the loop, human in the loop. I, I just, I can't say it enough. Um, whether it's intelligent automation, AI, RPA, <laughs> or any system, right? Um, we need to look at critical parts of it. We need to audit. We need to make sure that we are seeing how it's behaving. That's the best way that we can make sure that the flexibility and the right context is there for decision-making. It's just, we can't get rid of it. And this is my argument against, okay, you have all this capacity, you can let it go, or you can put humans in the loop and also have humans, you know, I, I, <laughs> I think it's a weird time in the world that I'm just, I, I've said human more than I ever have. Um, and that really comes down to, well, AI things are thinking. So now we have to distinguish AI and humans, but keeping the human in the loop. Um, again, we're all well aware of this monitoring and auditing, auditing data governance. Like you have to have it advanced cybersecurity. You have to have all of this. You know, anybody who wants the prize and the size of the prize is huge in AI and automation. If you don't have this, if you aren't cautious and pragmatic, things will not go great. You'll, worst, you'll lose a lot of money or <laughs> not the worst. That's the best. You'll lose a lot of money. The worst is something bad really happens that hurts people or your organization. So, you know, I hope... I hope, I hope, I hope, you know, folks like us are getting, you know, our due at least and being listened to around some of the things we've been talking about for years. Um, 
implementation strategies. Start simple, <laughs> one process that can be clearly measured and tracked. Identify a pilot and make sure it's delivering, you know, outcomes and, you know, it's a routine task. Like these are things we should always start with. And then some things will work, other things won't. And it won't just be a binary pass fail. It's going to be, well, this part worked and this didn't usually. Great. Like how do we use that thing that worked? And how do we scale it to other parts of the business or process departments? How do we find similar workflows? How do we um, fix the things that didn't quite work? How do we do that? So you start simple, you scale your successes. And then just like in Portlandia, they put a bird on it. Then you can start to think about putting an AI on it. Don't just start with putting an AI on it. Um, make sure that your RPA your processes are solid and then start to figure out, okay, what are those things that are adjacent to this that I can just make, you know, AI help with it and orchestrate different things, right? Like, you know, just throwing AI on poor RPA exasperates the issues that you're running into in the first place. So wait for it. Don't jump into it. All right, there's a guy with a weird thing on. Who knows what it is? We'll find out one day. But what's the future? Hyper automation. That sounds scary. Um, at the end of the day, just imagine entire business departments are just run on AI. I mean, can you imagine? Like now we are getting in the Skynet world, right? Um but at the end of the day, we will see hyper automation and it's going to be really, really cool. And it can make the world pretty, pretty cool. Now, whatever happens in the world is not up to us here. But at the end of the day, I think we are going to see, you know, things get hyper automated um, in a good way, <laughs> not in a bad way. Uh, secondly, you know, having autonomous workflows. Um, you know, right now you got a Tesla, you got, you know, self-drive <laughs> and it yells at you to make sure that you don't keep your eyes off the road and you have your hands on the steering wheel. I always laugh when, you know, and Tesla doesn't do um, uh, ads, at least I've not seen Tesla ads, but like, you know, whether it's GM or Ford. And I can say this because I have relatives that work for all big three because I'm from Detroit, just like Donald, where the Lions sucked most of our lives and are finally okay now. But at the end of the day, I laugh at the commercials where the guy's got like a, you know, a F-150 or, you know, a Sierra or some ginormous thing, a Hummer now. And they put on uh, autopilot and then they like, they kick back and have a Mai Tai and put their you know hands behind it. That's not how it works. I don't know when it's going to work like that, um, but we will see it. And um, you know, I was just I was just telling my daughter about you know the movie Back to the Future, like you know, because she asked, "Did you guys have hoverboards?" No, we didn't. It was in this movie that was supposed to take place, and I forget you know two thousand or two thousand two. We don't have any of it. It kind of 2015. Thanks, Mark. I couldn't I couldn't remember. All I remember is that, man, I'm still tying my own shoelaces. I some kids have a hoverboard. Um, but now I'm too old for it. At any rate, we will see some cool things. Um, and I really hope that they're safe. I really do. Um, and then finally edge computing, what the heck does it mean? You know, if you're following any of the, you know, big AI shops, you know, they gave us all access to their, you know, behemoth models. Now they're trying to desperately, 
desperately shrink those guys, make them be, or gals, make them be as small as possible and as effective as possible. Um, and I've always thought, you know, that's where the rubber is really going to meet the road is when, you know, automation systems, AI systems, it's all kind of happening locally. The cloud will be there, but there's a big reason why Open AI, Open AI and Apple have come to a deal. Um, and even though Apple is very far behind in the AI space, you know, you're going to see some cool stuff happening there. Um, I spent quite a bit of time working in the um, agriculture industry and just knowing what farmers go through. Um, there are so many, you know, it, it's all about how do we, how do we take things, you know, in real time and allow, you know, without the cloud, <laughs> something cool to happen. Or if it is the cloud, you know, can we do it off of, you know, a satellite signal? Like that is really where we're going to see some tremendous things. Like it's kind of cool and terrifying, just like everything new. Um, so here are my recap and ta key takeaways. And then, you know, we will open it up to any Q&A you might have or any discussions or comments you want to make cool with all of it. Um, you know, AI is taking automation beyond just RPA if thens, right? It's taking it beyond it, right? And I just I talked to you about how detecting and preventing fraud, I mean it's happening. Uh start small, scale strategically, right? Simple RPA keep what works and try to figure out how to use it more and fix the things that don't work and then put AI on it. Um, mitigation of key risks is crucial, right? Just like everything. I mean, I, I sound like a broken record, but I also think it's important that, you know, at least for folks that have listened to most of my stuff that I am repeating things because guess what? you know, this community in general hasn't been wrong <laughs> this whole time, right? There's still a ton of risk to using data incorrectly. Um, there's even more risk to using data, throwing it into a black box and letting things happen. There's, there's a lot of risk, um, you know, and as much as we want to maybe completely <laughs> do this hyper automation of making a Tesla, you still need to have humans involved and you still need to be cognizant of lowercase d. <laughs> um, and like I said, I just talked about it, but all of these, you know, things that we saw in 2015 and back to the future back in 1988 or whatever it was, you know, at the end of the day, these things will happen. Um, it's going to take somebody taking the right approaches to actually get there, but they will happen. And I'm, I'm hoping it'll make our lives better and probably a lot more interesting. And I always think I have no idea what to tell my daughter about what she's going to do for work or what the future is going to look like, because guess what? Uh, 2024 is um, as far away from 1980 as when, we were in the 80s or I was born in the 80s and um, people talked about 1920s and 30s. Like, think about that. Um, it's insane what's happened in my lifetime and it's insane it's what happened in the last 20 years in this space. And it's there's some cool, very scary stuff coming up, but um, I'm confident with a community like this trying to ensure things are done right that um, we are going to be okay. So that's my spiel. Um, and now if people had questions or comments, I'd love to hear them or see them or, you know, whatever, Mark, I'll, I'll kind of cue you up, uh, if you want to go and facilitate. Yeah. Well, yeah, get your questions in, um, or, or any kind of chat comments. I'd 
going through this presentation, Nick reminded me of uh, the before times uh, when I was implementing <laughs> a student information system and we had a consultant working with us and they thought they were so clever. I'd be like, we could bring all the data in from our legacy system into this new system by using something I call a robot. <laughs> and the, and the way out. they said and I was like, oh my God, my eyes must have rolled out of my chair. I, <laughs> I think I, I, I might have strained my neck at the time. Um, <laughs> but it, it reminded me, um, like right at that moment, I was like, but the data quality in our legacy system is just terrible. And if you turn on RPA and don't look at data quality first, um, then it's almost like a fly in the blender, right? Like <laughs> you just... You have a, an insane ability to put in a lot of bad data very quickly. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's for sure. It's, uh, I like to say accelerators instead of robots. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seems less aggressive. Any questions? Uh, you can throw them in the chat. You can, uh, yep, garbage in, garbage out. You got that right. Mm -hmm. Um. Let us know if you have any questions or type them in in the chat or the Q&A. Have you ever trained a LLM? And if so, what are some of the tips slash pitfalls to be aware of we got in the Q&A? Good question. I knew my guy from Detroit would come through with something. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I have. Um, and there are, Donald, you and everybody... You know, I have gone through, you know, training a pre-trained model <laughs> was one of the, the, um, and here, let me see. And don't worry, I'm not going to say go listen to me drone on longer, although that is kind of part of the solution. Um, but in general, let me, sorry, I'm trying to get to it real quick. User error. Do, 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 do. So in pre training a pre-trained AI model. I kind of go through that, Donald. Um, you know, in general, when the the large foundation models, I'll call them, first came out, people thought they were just gonna take a regular, you know, data science approach and try to train it and fine tune it. Um, so depending, it's really depends on your use case. Um, if you consider that large language models, large multimodal models, large foundation models, whatever we want to call them, right? They've been trained on the internet. <laughs> They've been trained on, you know, a ton of books and, and stuff of, and, you know, types of stuff. You don't really have to train it to understand um, language. However, you know, what you should do is, you know, most of the unique value you will get from an LLM or, again, a foundation model is to, you know, fine tune it to your use case. Now, when you do that, I recommend that you use the smallest large language model. Like, it's an SLLM. <laughs> um, you want to use the smallest one. Um, you want to have pretty well-organized content and data to train it on. Again, when you train AI models, you should have one set for training and one set for testing, and it can't be the same or else it's basically, you know, Mark writing the test and then taking the test. Now that might challenge his memory, but at the end of the, cause I would still get some wrong, but at the end of the day, um, you're going to want to have very distinct test and very distinct training, and you're going to want to do prompt tuning. So um, that's my recommendation is to use the smallest model possible, keep your testing and tra training data clean, make sure that all your content is vectorized and well kind of defined. And then of course, you know, make sure that you are, you know, taking advantage of, some prompt tuning that you can do to make sure that it does exactly what you want. It's funny that you mentioned vectorized because I was going to ask, uh, does, does your, um, uh, the data that you're training it on need to be in a vector database, but, uh, 
<laughs> that probably helps, I suppose. <laughs> I always, I always, Mark, I always go back to the fact that it's a genius five-year-old. You must tell it what is <laughs> yes. good and what is bad and what to believe and what not to believe. So, you know, <laughs> and in this case, vectorization is, you know, it's, it's the way to do it. Uh, we do have another question in Q&A. Can we connect Databricks with AI and eventually connect with Power BI dashboards? Or can we use AI directly in Power BI dashboards? Like, what is a better route for something like that? Great question. Um, so Databricks, they've invested heavily in allowing folks to use um, AI within their platform. Um, of course, that then can connect to Power BI. And then on the Microsoft side, um, you have the ability to um, use Fabric, which is kind of trying to do the same thing, which is to tie everything. So now, you know, they have their own kind of AI services. Obviously, um, they have some proprietary stuff. You know, they have access to, you know, their version of open AI stuff. But yeah, yeah. Um, Databricks has done a, a tremendous job um, in pretty much being able, not only have they created some of their own um, AI models to use, um, but they've also created, um, they've created just a, a platform and enhanced their platform to be able to bring in, you know, Llama or whichever one you might want to use. So um, depending on the use case, you kind of pick it. I'm I'm basically um, of the opinion that um, they are all of the models are very similar. So whatever ecosystem you tend to be on in in the cloud is probably going to be good enough to use for now. Um, and then yeah, Lawrence, to your point, um, within and not everything is you know Microsoft. <laughs> is a work in progress, but they are integrating, you know, AI into everything within Fabric, including Power BI, um, which it's pretty powerful, Lawrence. I'm not sure if you've used it yet, um, but they are getting to the point. I remember it must have been 10 years ago when IBM was trying to get Watson to do kind of what we can do now and what Microsoft's intending to, to use. So um, yeah, you're um, and actually that point, Lawrence would be July 23rd. I talked a lot about how this space of augmented analytics, you know, being able to do natural language query and natural language questions is, is available. So, um, thanks for contributing. That was a great question. Awesome. Well, thanks again, uh, everybody, for uh, contributing in chat and, and being amazing as always. And thank you, Nick, for this wonderful presentation. And that's all we have time for for today. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, I look forward to the next one, AI for Good, on October 22nd. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day, everybody.